Chapter Five of Kari the Elephant by Dan Gopal Mukherjee. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter Five: The Jungle Spirit. It took us much longer to return home. We lost nearly twenty-four hours in a jungle where we had the strangest experiences of our lives. We had already covered half the distance when, one day at noon, we reached the river across which lay the jungle. It was so hot that Kari would not go any further. The moment he smelt the moist earth of the river bank, he literally ran into the water and lay there. Kopi and I had to sit on his back, while the waves of the river played around us as the waves of the sea play around an island. Kari kept his trunk above the water, and when he moved we almost fell off his back. The monkey clung to me, for, as you know, monkeys do not know how to swim. There are two reasons why monkeys are afraid of the water. Not only are they unable to swim, because the fingers of their hands are not webbed together as a duck's toes, but being accustomed to go through the air by leaping from branch to branch, they think they should leap from place to place in the water. Seeing that the elephant was wayward, I told Kopi to hold on to my head. Then I swam ashore and waited for the elephant to come out. Now that we were off his back, he raised himself a little above the water and began to draw vast quantities of water up his trunk and snorted it out at the monkey, who was running up and down the shore, chattering fiercely and keeping a safe distance to avoid being drenched. This shows that elephants have a sense of humour. They always know where to keep a monkey, and it is the monkey's business to know when the elephant is going to indulge in humour. As elephants do not know that monkeys cannot swim, I was afraid that if Kopi was not careful, Kari might throw him into the river for fun, and that would have been the end of him. I soon forgot the elephant and the monkey, however, and fell asleep on the river bank. I was awakened by a terrible cry from the monkey and a trumpeting from the elephant. I sat up with a start and saw Kopi sitting on the ground, shivering with terror, and Kari standing in front of him, waving his trunk in the air and trumpeting for all he was worth. I lay on the ground and lifted myself up on my elbows. Through the elephant's legs I saw a great snake right under him, held almost between his forelegs. My blood congealed in terror. Of course, Kari was five years old. His skin was so thick that the cobra could not bite deep enough to bury his poison fangs into his arteries. The monkey was hypnotized with fear, but he could not run away, nor go forward, nor come to me. He sat there shivering with terror. I crept slyly around the elephant and approached Kopi. I knew that if I touched him he would turn around and bite me. He was so frightened that anything that touched him would mean to his excited brain only the sting of the snake. The idea that he would be stung to death had taken possession of the whole animal. I could see now what had happened. The elephant had stepped on the middle of the snake. Its back was broken and it could not move, but there was life in the rest of its body and it was standing erect like a sharp column of ebony, its black hood with a white mark on it spread out as large as the palm of a man's hand. Of course, it could not stay in that position long. It swayed and almost fell to the ground. The moment that happened, Kari raised his foot 
and put it down on the snake's neck. But the snake lifted up its head in such a way that, whenever there was a chance for the elephant to put its foot on its head, it would immediately raise itself on its broken back. Its agony must have been great, yet it would not give in for a long time. As the snake could not move with its back broken, and the foot of the elephant still on it, I knew I had better go and kill it with a stick. As I approached it with my stick, the monkey's eyes, which had been fixed on the snake, suddenly moved. He looked at me and bounded off with a piercing, chattering yell towards the nearest tree. The spirit of terror that had held him hypnotized so long was broken at last. For he had seen someone who could kill the snake. The moment the monkey bounded off, the snake stung the elephant's toenails, those horny plates around his feet. This is a vital spot, as the arteries come very near the surface. Knowing this, Kari raised his foot. Evidently he was not hurt, but I was not sure how long he could stand on three legs. I was also afraid that he would fall and bring his trunk near the snake, and any snake can poison an elephant by stinging the end of his trunk. I hit the snake on the head with my stick, but instead of striking his head, the stick slipped down that ebony column, which was still standing erect. Fortunately, in order to avoid the next blow, the snake fell on his side. That very instant the upraised foot of the elephant was on his head. Kari walked away and poured the sand with his feet to cleanse them. I thought of calling to Kopi, who had taken refuge in a treetop, but I was so anxious to know whether the elephant's foot was hurt or not that I followed him about till he let me look at it. I was relieved to see that the skin of his foot had not been broken. Then I called to the monkey to come down from the tree. He shook his head. I knew he was so ashamed of being afraid that he preferred to be alone in the privacy of the tree in order to gather his forces together. The sun was beginning to sink. The jungle was not very far off, and I was certain that the breeze blowing across the river had taken the scent of human beings into the depths of the forest. The twilight came swiftly. The bars of gold and light vibrated over the tawny waters, and darkness fell like a black sword, cutting the day from the night. The voices of the birds from the treetops here and there died down, and, as if to enhance the silence, insect voices came from under the grass. I got on my elephant's back and sat there quietly for as the evening silence goes by, each man must make his prayer. As the silence walked on, I could see the grass waving in zigzag curves across the river. It was always making half the figure eight in the undergrowth of the jungle. Gradually all grew still, and then over the river came the terrible hunger wail of a tiger. That instant its tawny face, scarred with black, emerged from behind green leaves. He saw I was across the river. The tiger's body is marked with the same stripes and curves as he makes in the grass where he walks, and people in the jungle can always tell by the wave of the grass which animal has passed that way? Throughout the countryside, whenever the echo of the wail was heard, attention fell upon everything. Even the saplings were tense, and you could almost hear the crackling of the muscles of the animals 
holding themselves together and watching which way the tiger would pass. It was as if the horn of the chase had sounded and blown. Each one had to take cover. Night came on apace. I wanted to tie Kari to a big tree, but he refused to be tied up that night. He paced up and down the shore without making the slightest noise. Then he would suddenly stand still and stop the waving of his ears in order to listen very intently to the shadows of songs that might be passing. I stayed on his back, intent in knowing what he was going to do. Soon, very soon, the river became silver-yellow, and over the jungle a quickening silence throbbed from leaf to leaf. Then, swiftly, the terrible face of the moon was upon us. Kari snorted and stepped backwards. I too was surprised because this was another moon, very rarely seen by men. It was the moon bringing the call of the summer to the jungle. It was the call for hunt and challenge, when elephants kill elephants to win their mates. And under the moon lay a great sinister figure, like the terrible face of a dragon. The July cloud was hovering in the distance, and between the cloud-banks and the moon I saw strange things, as if throngs of white animals were going from sky to sky. I know not why. No one ever knows. These are the spirits of the jungle, the dead ancestors of the animals now living. Without warning, Kari now plunged into the river. I spoke to him, scratched his neck with the ankus, but he would not stop. He forded the river, at times almost drowning, and charged madly up the other shore, where we were lost in the darkness of the leaves and vines. No moonlight fell on us, not even the knowledge that the moon was up could be vouched for in this thick, black, place. End of chapter 5